Having overcome the huge mountain massif of Bolshaya Fatra in the course of heavy and serious six-day fighting, and having liberated Martin, Vrutak, and other settlements in the Turek area, the troops of the 1st Czechoslovak Army Corps crossed the Turek Basin on 11 April without any rest or pause. On the same day they came into contact with the strongholds of the fascist defense on the Malafatra. These mountains closed the passage to the Ratsko-Zelina Basin from the southeast and proved to be a very serious obstacle to the advance of the course towards Zelina. Since December 1944, the enemy strengthened the defenses here, forcing the locals to work here. The importance of Malafatre increased even more when the German command developed a plan for the defense of the Czech lands, especially the Ostrava region. The town of Zelina therefore acquired not only important tactical, but also operational significance. The center of the main battles of the Corps was the southern part of the Malafatra Massif, west of the narrow gorge of the Via River. This forested, heavily rugged terrain with a large number of inaccessible steep slopes, slopes and ravines, steeply falling from a height of 600 to 900 meters into the surrounding valleys. The mountain slopes here are 30 and often 60 degrees. The enemy concentrated its efforts on the defense of the most important triangle of Mintral, Grun, Polum Mountains. On the slopes of the main ridge an impregnable system of strongholds was created, and in the rocky area of Polum pillboxes were built, which were almost impossible to take. The Corps failed to seize the boundaries on the Malaya Fatra. The troops stopped on mountainous ridges in front of well-organized enemy defense. The Czechoslovak infantry units, enticed by the enemy upwards, found themselves in a difficult situation. There were no usual forest roads to bring artillery closer to the infantry, to deliver food and ammunition. There were not even forest paths to evacuate the wounded. To carry a stretcher with one wounded man to the infirmary, we had to send eight soldiers. In addition to all this, the weather turned bad. In the mountains there was snow in some places up to three meters. It was necessary to lay roads in the snow, to raise guns and mortars in the mountains for direct fire. Otherwise it was impossible to capture the enemy positions. Stubborn battles did not subside. Sometimes the enemy sent groups of soldiers to the rear of our units, who stealthily infiltrated our communications through unguarded gaps, attacked stealthily and inflicted sensitive losses on us. As a result of the tremendous efforts of the soldiers and the local population, by 17 April five batteries of anti-tank artillery and most of the mortars had already been brought up into the mountains. As at Liptovsky Mikulas, oxen sleds performed well here. Six to eight pairs of oxen pulled a 76 mm cannon or a mortar. On the first three kilometers, we had to overcome a height difference of more than 700 meters with a slope of up to 30 degrees. The main battles unfolded only after the infantry received effective support from direct fire artillery. From 17 to 26 April, the battles were fought over the Polum and Grun Mountains. Attacks of the Czechoslovak infantry were repulsed by the enemy each time. On 19 April, until dusk, the enemy launched seven attacks, with significant forces and with the support of unusually heavy artillery fire. Finally, on 22 April, units of the 4th Brigade finally managed to seize Antipoloma. This key position was fought over for 20 days. Three days later, on 25 April, after an all-day battle, the fortified Grun Mountain was taken. In its persistence, fierceness, and bloodshed, the fighting at Malafatra was not inferior to the most severe battles of the previous months. This was partly due to the fact that the Czechoslovak troops fought here without the support of heavy Soviet weapons and with their own means. Tanks and aviation could not be used in the battles at Malafatra. This was hindered by the heavy, almost impassable terrain, which created insurmountable obstacles for the deployment of tank troops. As for aviation, its use to support combat operations in the mountainous and forested area of Bolshaya and Malaya Fatra was constantly disrupted by persistent bad weather. The court commander regrouped his forces twice before it became clear that with the existing combat order of the troops it was impossible either to take greater and lesser Fatra in a surprise attack from the start 
or to capture both of the main mountain bastions, Mount Paulum and Mount Grun. The court commander concentrated all efforts against these key sites on a narrow section of the front. On 30 April, our units finally broke the stubborn resistance of the enemy and opened the way to Jelena. Court command in the battles for Bolshaya and Malaya Fatra demonstrated its ability to find a way out of the most difficult situations, which were created by the experienced, ready-for-anything enemy. The court's command was able to maneuver the troops, often change the combat order, shrewdly solve the traps set by the enemy. It should be considered a merit of the command that it did not allow the troops to descend from the mountains into the Retskaya Hollow, where the infantry would have been destroyed. Life in the mountains. On the 1,304-meter high Vuplas mountain, the arrival of spring was not yet felt. Rain with snow had soaked up the thick layers of snow, wetting the soil. Cold water seeped through the roofs and walls of the dugouts, and everything around seemed unfriendly and gloomy. The soul was not happy either. At night there was no peace either. Groups of specially selected fascist thugs penetrated into the areas of command posts and officers dug out and attacked them. There were fights with the guards. Danger awaited us at every step. My security and peace of mind at night was ensured by Soldier Bila, a broad-shouldered big man, a former member of the Slovak insurgent army from somewhere in Turek. In the evening of each day, his mighty figure, with a machine gun in his hand, squeezed into the passage of my narrow dugout, which meant that from that moment on neither light nor air could enter my room. Bela could be relied upon. He guarded my peace at night with unbridled zeal. It was not safe to be near him at that time. One night I heard Bela's decisive cry, Shoot! I knew well that Bela was quick from words to action. I ran out, and at the very last moment I was able to prevent an accident. What happened? One of our soldiers had gone out for some necessities, and having lost his way in the fog, had wandered into a bush in the immediate vicinity of Bela. When Bela stoked the makeshift stove, it was simply impossible to stay in the dugout because of the acrid smoke, so at night I mostly put out the fire. Though I was soon cold, another evil was water. The snow and rain would penetrate through the top of the shelter, and the water would drip down onto my tent. Drop after drop clattered in various places on my tarp, keeping me awake. All of this made me nervous. One day I was in a bad mood, so I complained to Bella. He'd been gone since morning. There was no sign of him in the whole of a plaza. Concerned, I went out to the road in the evening. Suddenly I saw him pull up on a country cart pulled by a pair of oxen, carrying a fine American fireplace. I froze. Bila. I asked him, where did you steal it? He was silent, as if he had water in his mouth. To get the fireplace into the dugout, Bila had to widen the entrance. But the fireplace smoked terribly, and after a few days I threw it out. When we came down from the mountains, I found myself on a day's rest in Vraki. My headquarters had found a cozy villa for my accommodation. When the landlady saw me, she swore at me, saying she didn't need any soldiers. There was a damn villain who had stolen her wonderful American fireplace. There was nothing to do, so I left the house. That was Bela. A loyal, resourceful, hot-tempered man. The artillery is coming in. On the inclement day of the 20th of April, about noon, a misfortune happened. A heavy shell exploded in the fighting order of our infantry, which was preparing to attack Mount Polum, killing and wounding dozens of people. The shell was fired by our battery of the 5th Corps of Artillery Regiment. The fact is that against strongly fortified positions on Polum, the firing of smaller caliber guns in the previous days was ineffective and heavy artillery came into action and so to the heavy losses suffered by the infantry during the hard fighting with the enemy were added these even more bitter losses from their own fire. With all possible accuracy in determining the coordinates of the target, sometimes it was not possible to completely exclude the misses of shells and their bursting in the infantry position, especially if the infantry was advancing on heavily rugged terrain or in bad weather. However, all this did not apply to this particular case, 
when we had excellent conditions for suppressing the enemy with accurate fire. Every time I learnt of the bursting of my shells among our infantrymen, I was severely distressed. Such news always hurt. Death is death, no matter from which side it came. Infantry is known to be affected by morale rather than physical loss. Although the number of unfortunate underflies was small, each of these incidents undermined the infantryman's confidence in the artillerymen. It was a serious problem with dire consequences. So, how could this accident have happened? The fatal shell was fired at 9.35 a.m. from a firing position north of the town of Martin, at a set range of 13.5 kilometers. The infantry battalion lay down on the initial line, 400 meters from the top of the mountain. The battery commander made all the necessary calculations for firing and determined the exact direction of the shell's flight. Now the gunner had to show his skill. And John Ogorniak would never have fired a shell into the air if he had not been sure of the accuracy of the gun. He was well aware that any deviation in the installation of even a fraction of a millimeter could lead to a blow to his attacking infantry. With his keen eye, Gorniak was able to notice the smallest, almost invisible deviation. And so the senior officer on the battery raised his hand. A shot sounded. When the shell went down to the target, a growing noise was heard overhead. Everyone waited with tension where the burst would occur. At last, somewhere low below the mountain, a great rumbling sound was heard, echoing repeatedly among the heights. Then came an ominous silence. The blow came on our infantry. The court commander at the NP unbuttoned the collar. On everyone's lips froze a question. I shook off a momentary stupor. Everything became clear to me. In accordance with the set sight, the shell was to hit the note of the Hitlerate's defense. When the shot was fired from this gun, and it was the first one that day, the barrel of the gun had not heated up yet. The metal was compressed. The gas was reduced in the rifles. The pressure in the barrel decreased. When flying in the high layers of the atmosphere, the projectile was affected by the wind and deflected from its course. These and other reasons caused the projectile to fall 300 meters closer to the target and 120 meters off course. If the gun barrel had been hot, if the harsh winds had not blown high above the clouds, if the strength and direction of these winds had been measured at different altitudes, if the heat, pressure and humidity of the air had been accurately taken into account, if, finally, the determination of the range and angle of fire had been based on geodetic data and estimates, the shell would have fallen victoriously on the heads of the enemy with a curse to Hitler. Yes, if all these factors had been taken into account on the ill-fated day of 20 April, then the bloody battle for Palam would have taken a different path. And without meteorology, without accurate preparation of data for firing, it was impossible. So why even later, the usual and specific influences on flying shells were not eliminated by correction? At that time, the 4th Ukrainian Front, in whose subordination the 1st Czechoslovak Army Corps was operating at that time, concentrated all its forces on the main strategic direction Kreko, Silesian Basin, Ostrava. And it turned out that in the area of Malafatra the systems of high meteorological service and army geodetic units were not deployed. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. Two days after this event, a new misfortune occurred. It befell the commander of the Soviet Guards Division, which was advancing to the right of the corps in the billet area on the Orava direction. The Soviet units met fierce resistance everywhere and moved forward with great difficulty. We, too, fought hard that day for Polom. We had a more favorable position in the sense that the battlefield on the Malafatra ridges was suddenly free of fog, and in the Vag Valley the fog was a dense wall. From there, from the neighborhood of Varin, a cannonade was heard all day long. Judging by the sound of artillery firing of the German battery closest to us, we decided that it was of large caliber. How to locate it? After all, we occupied a favorable position and had opportunities to unexpectedly drop fire and destroy this battery. True, we lacked a trifle. We did not know its location. When we were informed by the front telegraph about the death of the commander of the neighboring division as a result of a direct hit of a shell on the NP, 
We thought about how to take revenge on the enemy. It took us a long time to remove the veil of secrecy from the German battery. Over the valley froze clouds of fog. It was raining. We could only hope for April weather and wait for it to clear up. The battle on the Orava direction was intensifying. Meanwhile, the enemy battery could slip away with impunity. This thought did not give me rest. Preoccupied with the battle, we did not immediately notice that the fog in the valley began to thin, as if it had been scattered by a storm. When we looked down at the wag from the ridge, we were stunned. I could not believe my eyes. The enemy battery was exactly where we thought it would be. All those standing at the NP were extremely excited by such an amazing coincidence. The large caliber German battery we were looking for was in firing positions on the northern outskirts of Strekno, in the bend between the VAG and the motorway, and was firing all its guns at a high rate. From a distance of three kilometers with 15-fold binoculars, we could clearly see how the individual numbers of the gun crews moved. The loaders brought shells to the guns, pushed them into the breach. The gunners ran away to cover before firing, and then returned to the guns. We were looking directly at the rear of the battery from top to bottom from a distance of 1,100 meters. It was clear that fire on the enemy had to be opened unexpectedly and as quickly as possible if we were to deliver a powerful destructive blow to the battery. It was not so easy and quick to prepare the fire, given the complicated calculations of the initial data inside observation and the little experience of the officers in firing at such unusual targets. I was beginning to lose my temper. It seemed like an eternity before the first shot was finally fired followed by the second. However, both shells flew away. I moved away from the regimental commander so as not to annoy him. And then again, I had to goggle my eyes in surprise. A high dense wall of fog was slowly creeping from the northwest towards the enemy's battery. Hearing the bursts of shells, the gun crews on the enemy battery stopped firing and hid in the shelters. An impenetrable veil of fog was unstoppably approaching. It was already a kilometer away from the German battery, and we had not yet opened fire with all the guns. I was ready to burst with annoyance. Hurry up! I shouted at the top of my voice, though I realized that we had lost the battle, that the thick fog was about to cover the enemy battery. Wanting to do better, the artillerymen took too long to prepare the data. For a while they fired blindly into the fog, then all the guns thundered, Shells rustled through the air. However, the enemy battery did not respond. On the morning it became known that it was no longer in place. It was an unpleasant incident for us. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. The temporary failure of the units of the 4th Brigade in the Palum area was partially compensated on 21 April by the success of the 3rd Battalion. For a number of days, the battalion tried unsuccessfully to break the enemy resistance in the area of the quarry near the railway Gondola Dubniskala, northwest of Frutak, where the Vaga Gorge begins. Hitlerites settled on this position, having built concreted pillboxes and firmly covered the approaches to Strekno. After repeated unsuccessful attempts to take Dubniskala, which only added to the number of casualties, it was decided to destroy the resistance nodes in the quarry by direct fire from a 152 mm howitzer cannon and several anti-tank guns of the 2nd Artillery Regiment. However, it turned out to be inconvenient to fire from firing positions on the northern outskirts of Rutak with the quarry. This problem was simply and boldly solved by the artillerymen of the 5th Artillery Regiment. With the help of a steel rope, they dragged the heavy gun at night to the right bank of the river and skillfully camouflaged it there. I was very anxious when the gun disappeared under the water, as the swift current might have overturned it, but everything turned out safely. At 13 hours 30 minutes from a distance of 1,000 meters, the howitzer opened an unexpected for Hitlerites direct fire on enemy pillboxes, which could not be taken by infantry. As a result, the pillboxes with six heavy machine guns were destroyed, their garrisons were suppressed, and the infantrymen of the 3rd Brigade took the quarry without losses. This forward gun performed its task brilliantly, despite the difficult conditions, 
for at the time of firing its own infantry were only fifty meters from the enemy. The next day, thanks to the success of the artillerymen, the infantrymen further penetrated the Nazi defense in the neck of the Vaga Gorge. On the morning of Hitler's birthday, the Nazi flag appeared on Mount Grun. It was clearly visible from the NP on a plaza. I involuntarily thought how long this flag would last and who would take it down. Rothmister Vajdik took aim with his 76mm anti-tank gun and shot down the flag with the third shot. To hit such a target from almost two kilometers away is not a bad success. In the Battle for Pole On 20 April, together with the commander of the 1st Brigade, I lingered near two 76mm anti-tank guns mounted on a mountain ridge in front of Polum. The muzzles of the guns were pointed directly at the fortified mountaintop. From a distance of 700 meters, in moments of calm, the movement of the Germans on the Polum Massif was clearly visible. Not far away were two other of our cannons, ready to fire. In a deep hollow in front of a high rocky wall, prepared to attack, lay an infantry battalion. At the very top of the mountain, sharp rocks and sparse trees jutted against the sky. I asked the colonel how he thought to support the infantry attack with artillery fire. He waved his hand in the negative and answered that he did not want to open direct fire on the mountain because he was afraid of hitting his infantry, which might panic and flee from Polum. I take responsibility for the gunners. I said as I believed in the successful work of the artillerymen, but the colonel continued to refuse. Foreseeing that in the next few minutes something irreparable might happen, I tried to persuade the colonel that in this very exceptional case we could really guarantee the safety of the infantry. But he persisted. If a single shell bursts among them, I shall not be able to lift them, said the colonel. The attack, if you can call it that, began, for in order to destroy the enemy's resistance nodes on Palum, the infantrymen had to climb up the slope at an angle of sixty degrees on all fours. Hand grenades fell on the heads of the advancing troops. Hitlerites dropped them in whole boxes, shot our soldiers from machine guns and phosphatrons. When a grenade fell on the ground, its burst for a split second illuminated the infantrymen in the vicinity, and when a bunch of grenades exploded, everything around was illuminated with blinding light and thickly sprinkled with deadly shrapnel. And the anti-tank guns were silent, they were not allowed to fire. That was the trouble. The attackers climbed and climbed forward until their slow, heavy advance stopped. A little more, and the irreparable would have happened. Panic had already set in among the infantrymen, and they were ready to rush down the slope into the gully. A minute more, and they would not have survived such a scorcher. At that moment anti-tank guns opened a targeted fire on the top of the mountain. The Hitlerites, leaving the dead, hastily withdrew to the rocky shelters of Polum, and the infantrymen under cover of fire secured themselves at the foot of the steep mountain. The observation post became quiet. The colonel breathed a sigh of relief. I looked into his eyes, but Ops looked away. During the sleepless night I was haunted for a long time by a terrible picture. Infantrymen climbing up an inaccessible steep mountainside towards the frenzied fire. And even now, many years later, this picture sends shivers down my spine. Battles for Polum with unrelenting fierceness went since 17th of April, and only on 22nd of April the hard struggle ended with victory over Hitlerites. Spring has come to us. Below in the valleys, spring had already come, but up in the mountains there was still snow. In the half of April fresh snow fell here, and having melted at once, turned the roads into impassable pits and potholes clogged with snow mush, and yet spring was coming unstoppably. One had to look through binoculars at the Zielinski region, where the snow had already melted, and one felt cheerful. At dawn on the 29th of April the Germans began their retreat to Zielina. They were pursued by court troops and Soviet units along the right bank of the Vag. I also came down from the mountains, it was one of the unique clear and warm days, when the heart overflows with joyful and bright hope. Amazed by the beauty of spring nature, I stopped on a stony path. At these moments I did not think about the danger. I wanted to believe that nothing in the world would stop the victory of good over evil. 
Silence descended into the valleys, and this unexpected silence turned our heads. It was surprisingly light. In the gap between the mountains I saw the ruins of the castle of Strekno below. The whole area lay beneath me as if in the palm of my hand, bathed in the rays of the spring sun. The slender beaches on the summits had also woken up from their winter hibernation and were already beginning to turn green. After two hours of almost continuous descent from the height of 1300 meters, we reached the spring valley of Vaksha. The gardens in Strekno were flooded with a sea of blooming lilacs. Fiery bright geranium flowers looked out of the small windows of low houses. But the first thing I perceived as a gift from heaven was the gracious warmth. Once in the midst of spring, I felt all the evil that seemed unbearable in the mountains float away and disappear. My whole being was irresistibly drawn to calmness and security, to beauty and art, to everything that had long been longing for complete satisfaction in me. The marvelous atmosphere of spring, joy and enthusiasm was alien to the pictures of war. Man is not able to rejoice wholeheartedly when he is surrounded by sorrow and misery. An incident on the river. Fascinated by spring, I walked briskly along the street, as if in a victory parade. My attention was attracted by a large group of warriors standing motionless on the bank of the vag. The river was out of its banks and raging with floods, carrying its waters swiftly and causing an eerie sense of danger. I went to the group of soldiers. In the middle of the overflowing vag, a Hitlerite soldier was sticking out on the remains of the foundations of the wooden bridge, which had been destroyed by the Nazis at night. Holding on to a pile with one hand, he waved and gave signs with the other, to which, however, nobody reacted. God knows how he got there. It seemed that the German was about to throw himself into the water to come to us, but he continued to stand helplessly. Either he could not swim, or he was afraid of water or captivity. The soldiers gestured for him to swim to shore, but he hesitated. Finally, it became clear to everyone that the German was afraid. While the soldiers were watching this tragic spectacle, something irreparable happened. People standing on the shore as if on some signal suddenly became numb. I looked into the faces of the soldiers, picking them out one by one. In their eyes I noticed that peculiar expression, the familiar deafening, ominous silence of men seized by a single thought suggested that they were leaning towards a terrible decision. An unarmed enemy in distress would be killed. Excited, but unable to take a decisive step, I walked quickly away, while the soldiers continued to stand in a daze. After walking a few hundred paces, I heard a short machine gun burst. The blood froze in my veins. My premonition had come true. I turned and ran back to the shore. There was almost no one there. The formidable waves of the vag were silently rushing past the remains of the bridge, but I did not see that fascist there. But it was enough to say one word to those people, and he would have survived. Minutes decided everything. Why did I suppress the desire to do a noble deed? To exterminate the enemy in myself? I have asked myself this question many times in my life. That German soldier, sitting in despair on a pile surrounded by the raging elements, at first aroused my compassion for his fate, but in my soul, God knows where from. Another feeling rose up, and it was stronger. I tried not to think about it, but I could not. After all, the German was in a desperate situation, and he belonged to the human race. And again, somewhere in the windings of my brain another thought was born and those feelings of love, forgiveness, and delight, which had seized me under the impression of spring splendor, turned into their opposite. But again some inner voice whispered to me, At the critical moment you failed to make a decisive step. But for what? Should I have risked myself for a German? Why did I run away before the shots rang out? What prevented me from helping? I lost the fight against the enemy and myself. Heroism of such a character was needed here, that a man on whom the life of another man depended remained on the captain's bridge and was not afraid to act. There are scarcely any scales so exact as these, capable of measuring the just limits of action. The unfortunate German had a right to life, to mercy, if only for the sake of this spring day. 
the two dozen Czechoslovak soldiers of the 7th and 9th Battalions, who were taken prisoner at Polom on 22 April 1945 and brutally tortured by the Nazis, also had the right to life and mercy, at least for the sake of that spring day. Now everything is back to normal. Moravia, Moravishka. After the loss of the Polom and Grun Mountains, the Germans tried to cling to the back slopes in the ruins of Strekno Castle, but we threw them out of there as well. The infantry came down from the mountains easily. The guns were more difficult. We lowered them on ropes, cut cuts in the forest, built roads. It was much more difficult to bring the guns down from the mountains to the valley than to bring them up to the mountains three weeks ago. On the 30th of April we came down to the road Strekno, Zhilina. On that day, the soldiers of the First Ukrainian Front hoisted the banner over Hitler's Reichstag in Berlin. Here the Germans stopped on the plain in front of Zhilina, where they had well-equipped defensive positions. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. The larks were ringing over the spring fields behind Strekno. I remember watching the rapid flight of these birds towards the sun. High in the sky, a lark stood still, sang its song, then suddenly fell silent and rushed to the ground like a shot. In the field lay a dead young German. I picked up a letter lying nearby. His wife wrote to him that she was tormented by forebodings. Let him coast, coast properly, as he had promised her. Meanwhile, our infantry came into contact with the enemy at the positions near Jelena. For tactical reasons, so as not to attack such a large city, the units regrouped to strike from the south, but the Germans were no longer able to offer serious resistance. Early in the morning, units of the 3rd Brigade managed to penetrate the town. There was no time for triumph, for before us lay the high water via, and behind it the Javorniki Ridge, the last major obstacle on the road to Prague. The units of the 1st Czechoslovak Corps reached the left bank of the V on the evening of 20 April on a 15-kilometer front. The 4th Brigade advanced on the left flank of the corps through Rajik to the Pavask Tepl area. The 1st Brigade moved in the center of the battle order through Rajek Teplice and Solo to the Predmir area, while the units of the 3rd Brigade, having passed through Zelina, continued to advance directly westwards into the big bend of the Wag River. Skirmishes occurred somewhere. On the night of 1 May sappers began construction of a light 10-ton bridge. Meanwhile, the first echelons of infantry were forcing the river with improvised crossing aids. In the afternoon, the light pontoon bridge was ready and the heavy vehicles began to cross. Under heavy loads, the pontoons hid in the harsh cold waters of the Wag. The bridge creaked and rattled. There was a danger that the cables would break and the bridge would separate, but it held. On the 2nd of May, our sappers from the left bank and Soviet sappers from the right bank started to build a heavy 30-ton bridge at Bitch. The old bridge here was destroyed by the Germans. From the very morning on this day, our units on several routes began the ascent to Yavorniki. The soldiers were very tired. The ascent was slow. Everyone needed rest. The weather turned bad. It rained lightly. The roads became disgusting. For two days, the ascent continued. On the night of the 4th of May, we crossed the ridges, and on the section of Seton, Will Carlois, we entered the valley of the river Ornibekva. In the hot afternoon, we reached the barrier on the former border of the protectorate near Gornji Ladishi near Seton. Now we could rejoice in freedom, but nevertheless at the first moment I had the impression that nothing had happened. People were well aware of what was happening, but inwardly, they still felt out of place. The worst was over. Where did this depression come from? This was the picture we saw in the farms and in the first villages on the Moravian land. The inhabitants could not yet believe that their liberators had come, that their torment had really come to an end. They must have endured a lot if their fear did not leave them at once. The May nature was beautiful, quiet, majestic. I closed my eyes and breathed in the air of my homeland the aromas of the Moravian land. I felt light and calm. At the border barrier, I realized that my dream had come true. More than once I returned mentally to the past, dear but so distant, and the images of my relatives, faded with time, seemed forgotten 
and distorted. But in Ledecky, everything suddenly came to life, became close and dear. My favorite land, on which we had so unexpectedly entered, seemed to bring me back to my youth. Under fire, my native town. The plan was to reach Vsetin by the end of the day on 2 May, but because of the enemy resistance the units of the 4th Brigade entered the town only on 4 May at about 16.00. The liberators were immediately captured by the hospitable Wallachs. The tables in the streets were bursting with treats, accordion dances, and Slovakian dances were dashingly danced. However, soon the main forces of the Corps continued to move forward in accordance with the order of the commander of the 18th Army, along the Liptal Valley to Frischtak, and part of the forces through Gostjalkava to Bistrishika near Gostin. I was taking the northern route along the Radaborsh Valley to Gostialkoa. Before leaving Vsetina, I ordered the commander of the 5th Heavy Artillery Regiment, Colonel Boshik, to open a disturbing fire on the town of Walask Mizerjici. This was due to military necessity. The town was at an important crossroads of highways and railways, along which Hitler's rear guards were retreating behind Granis and Prusirov since the morning of 5 May. Fire would be opened on my hometown. I waited for five and a half long war years, when through the misty gloom of time and endless battles, I would come to my native land. And now at the very end of the war, I gave the order to fire on my native town. The order can't be canceled. And there are not only enemies in the city, but also my fellow countrymen. And perhaps some of my relatives and friends will also become a victim. The fact that I had to give the order to open fire on Mizerjici seemed so absurd and insane that I could not come to my senses. Yes, answered the colonel, to open fire on Velaske Mizerisi from positions north of Seton, from a distance of 16 kilometers. Each of his words echoed painfully in my heart. Colonel Boshik answered in a businesslike and impartial manner, although he knew that this was my hometown. How do you save your city? I, like a prayer, quietly said, my hometown. Then I left. Did the colonel understand me? He was always businesslike and precise. That's how I knew him. A meeting with a good ending. When it dawned, we drove to Bistrashitz near Gostin. It was a warm, sunny day, one of those days when you want to lie down in a meadow. The road became freer and the traffic calmed down. I did not want to believe that the war was still going on. It was already, as they say, over our shoulders. I believed that now we would survive it all. Shpachik's long nose hung over the steering wheel. The driver was looking ahead carefully. We entered Gostelkova. From the upper end of the long village street came a distant gunfire. We stopped near the police building. German units, retreating to Prerov, are passing through the village and have just encountered partisans, a policeman reported to me. I looked through my binoculars at the edge of the forest, a kilometer from the road, and examined it in detail for several minutes. There I saw a few men at first, and then more. They turned round in a chain and went straight towards the village. Germans, up to two hundred men. They marched in a straight line, as if on a parade ground. I laughed at the primness and unnaturalness of it but I didn't want to laugh. What to do? From the upper end of Gostjolkova down to Radaborj the wagons of the wagon train were galloping, straight into the jaws of the enemy. Hearing the gunfire, the soldiers of the wagon looked out from under the tarpaulin, to battle. I gave the command. All lay down, and we turned out to be about twenty men. We were armed with rifles and only two automatic rifles. We could already distinguish the light ovals of the faces of the enemy soldiers. They came closer and closer. And then, at the most critical moment, I saw an anti-tank gun traveling through the village from Seton, which had been delayed in the town because of a malfunction, and was now catching up with its unit. On my order it turned round right on the road and opened fire on the fascists. However, their machine gun fire quickly found our cannon. And now, the radiator was punctured and leaked, part of the gun crew was put out of action. And then it began. There was no time for fear. We lay down under the cover of lush green gardens. We were completely taken over by close combat, 
the heaviest form of human combat, not for life but for death. Next to me is a nimble, brave soldier. He shoots, hides, then shoots again. Here is another German collapsed on the ground. The soldier tore off his epaulets for some reason. Then, when it was all over, he showed me his trophy. I see that he killed a doctor, but the doctor had a rifle. We hardly got out of the encirclement. Besides, the Germans were in a hurry. They had no time for us. The fight of our group with the enemy lasted till the afternoon, and on the western outskirts of the long village partisans and local patriots fought with Hitlerites almost till evening. The German unit was led by a Nazi general. He was endeavoring at all costs to break through to the west. We gradually withdrew to Radebors, which was two kilometers from the battle site. In the direction towards Prerov, the remnants of the enemy infantry were passing through Gostelkova. Immediately after the fight with the enemy, in the afternoon, out of breath, smelling of gunpowder, we reached the outskirts of the village. And then I almost had a heart attack. Hidden in a barn, our full-blooded infantry platoon, with two heavy machine guns, settled down in silence and tranquility. The platoon was led by a young lieutenant whose name, fortunately for him, had faded from my memory. I was furious. The platoon commander had shown no initiative whatsoever to join the battle, which had been playing out under his very nose since early morning. He was hiding in a secluded place, waiting for the outcome of the battle, instead of helping the unit under attack. He had firepower that would have had a decisive effect on the battle. It could have happened that all of us would have been killed, and the sub-lieutenant and his unit would not have lifted a finger to help. The look on his frightened face made me lose my temper completely. Everything happened very quickly. I drew my pistol and pointed it at the lieutenant, intending to shoot him for his cowardice. In a fraction of a second, I saw him covered with the sweat of death, and standing before me, pale and limp, looking away, though I could tell from his clouded gaze that he could see nothing. He did not utter a single word in his defense. I don't know why. But at that fateful moment I didn't pull the trigger. I guess the horror of death reflected in his eyes suddenly stopped me. And the next moment it was too late. I lowered my weapon. The lieutenant took a deep breath. I pulled myself together, and my first impulse to put a decisive stop to the display of cowardice by an unappealing verdict began to change. All the anger that had accumulated in me came out in loud curses. Thus the misfortune that threatened us both found its way out. I attacked the lieutenant with swearing, waving my fists and cursing. As I stood with my pistol pointed at the cowardly officer, I was stopped by an inner voice of warning. On the one hand, I could have shot the man on the spot. I had that right under military law. This is certainly not a typical case of a soldier being shot for cowardice. All armies employ this measure in certain circumstances as an unavoidable surgical remedy to prevent a severe moral crisis during battle. On the other hand, how would I have felt if I had unnecessarily taken a young man's life at the end of the war? It could not have been worse for me. I am grateful to fate for a peaceful old age, although of course, I may not have been a very good soldier. Killing a man is not always the most effective means of maintaining discipline. Even in such a critical situation, when our panic-stricken troops were retreating from Mikulash, I did not shoot at the fleeing men to stop them. The anti-tank guns, by their selfless actions and fire, covered then the retreat of the infantry and bought time to organize the defense. When we had put ourselves in order in Radibors, I organized the two units under my overall command, and they moved on Gostyalkova in order to recapture this settlement from the enemy to take us on the defensive, and to hold in our hands the road Vsetin, Bystris near Gostin, as a communication link for communications and logistics. The sub-lieutenant could now wash away the stain of disgrace, but I was no longer able to see it. Our 9th Battalion was moving from Radibors to Gostyalkova, to the commander of which I handed over the command, and I myself began to fulfill my original task. Silence and tranquility returned to Gostyalkova. Only the dead did not see it. I got into the car next to Spasik and said, On Bistris, I was terribly anxious to live. 
Isn't it terrible to fall dead ten kilometers from the threshold of one's home after five years of torture and wandering along the war roads on a foreign side? One day my grandchildren asked me why I received the medal for bravery. The last one was given to me for Goshielkova. I answered. At home. Six years later. On the 6th of May the units of the 1st Czechoslovak Corps, having overcome the enemy resistance, came out of the forest area of the Gostin Mountains and occupied Bystris near Gostin and Golesho. The Nazis still held Tukini and the adjacent slopes for some time. General Klapolik and I watched the battle from the tower of the Golesho Church. A cold wind was blowing through the openings of the tower. Up there, we learnt about the terrible tragedy near the village of Rindness. There were no more big battles, and I began to think about my relatives in Velasque Mezerici. On the next day, the general authorized me to drive from Bistris to Mezerici. It was still unsafe to take the road to Konovis and Brajaki, so we set off at dawn back to Gostolkova, and then down the Vsetinsky Bekva Valley to Mezerici. At Stinadlax, towering above the town, we stopped to look round. It was quite near. The town lay shrouded in the morning spring haze. I wanted to shout with happiness. I was back in my town after all. Never before or since had I felt so happy. I was exhausted, in the dirt and dust, but the picture that opened before me excited me to the core. For this was the city of my childhood, my dreams and blissful memories. The city of my joys and sorrows. How I loved it, this city of mine. At the first moment it seemed to me that everything remained the same, but my heart was suddenly squeezed by an uneasy premonition. I thought almost with certainty that I would never see my father again. Haunted by these thoughts, I went to see my brother, who worked as a teacher in Visok at Lezen. I drove through Mezerzici. The town was liberated by the troops of the 17th Guards Rifle Corps advancing from Yavornikov and Rajnov. Not long ago we together with them beat Hitlerites north of Malafatra. My father did not wait for my return. He died in January 1941. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. The first stop we made was at the cemetery. The last time I saw my father was six years ago. He was in his old brown hat, with a gray beard, with a stick in his hand, which he tapped in time with his steps. Between the trees and tombstones I saw a grave, and even from a distance I noticed that the stone slab had two columns of text carved on it. When I stopped, I caught my breath. My father was dead, and now I had taken his place on the road of eternity. Until yesterday I was still his child, though no longer young, but a child. Father was in the front, and I was following him. Now I have come to the front and will walk alone on the off-the-beaten path. I loved my father very much. For fifty years he turned the wheel of the lithe tirelessly and gave magic shapes to wood with his skillful hands. I always looked at him with admiration, savoring the scent of wood. Something has now been cut short, and nothing in the world will make up for it. My mother was buried next to my father. Her death was the first in our family. Standing by the graves, bordered by birch trees, whose fresh narrow leaves were covered with dew and fluttered gently in the morning breeze, shining in the thousands of glints of the rising sun. I remembered that sad spring eleven years ago, when we buried my mother. It was all deeply etched in my memory. On the eve of her death, I drew a portrait of Mum. I don't know where I got the strength to smile at my mother while working on the portrait, although my heart shrank at the sight of her tender, infinitely gentle face, illuminated by forgiveness. She looked at me with a surprised, long and hazy gaze, and I guessed how far her thoughts were drifting. We both knew what would happen in a few hours. It was the saddest thing I had ever experienced. Then she died. At that moment I clearly understood what it would mean to us that my mother had left us, that I had lost her forever. I will keep her memory alive until my last breath. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. In the square, being in the circle of fellow countrymen, I felt more cheerful. They wanted to know a lot of things. One of them was silent for a long time, then slowly and judiciously asked, How were you able to win such a war? 
I did not know what exactly he was interested in. And he continued with a nice smile. After all, all the shells fly a kilometer further. I kept silent about the truth, and I thought to myself with gratitude about Colonel Boshik, who understood me after all. On the way to Prague, after my trip to Velasque Miserici, I found the court commander still in Holsov. During my absence there had been significant clashes with the retreating enemy at Lukov. Units of the 1st Brigade occupied Frischtak. The 4th Brigade, which was advancing from the Gostinsky Hills to the west, was not without fighting and losses. While fighting was still going on north of Galesho, Korf units were moving towards Gulen. They were to quickly seize Prerov in order to cut off the Nazis' escape routes through this important railway junction to the west from the Lipnik and Pranis areas. The commander of the 18th Army attached great importance to the quick capture of Prerov. He even promised to award the court commander with the order of Suvorov, first class. However, nothing came out of it. The Hitlerites blocked the road to Prerov with large forces, and during the advance the units of the 4th Brigade met strong resistance at Rennes and Kolichin. On the night of 7 May a battle broke out near the village of Berzist in the Pursarov direction. As a result of the battle, which lasted the whole day, the enemy captured the village and the surrounding area. After this failure, the army commander cancelled further fighting for Prerov and ordered to move further westwards through Kramaris and Koten. The Germans held Berzist until dusk and abandoned it only on the night of 8 May. It seemed that the war was about to come to an end, but how much more blood had to be shed before true peace came. Czechoslovak soldiers continued to die in ambushes. They were brutally killed around corners. Sometimes it happened because of their own carelessness, thoughtlessness, and indiscipline. As a result of unauthorized absences from the unit, traveling in dangerous areas at their own risk, failure to observe the elementary rules of guarding. Many of our fighters died on the Moravian soil. They were buried where they fell. Especially bitter were the losses of the corps on 6 and 7 May, in the cemeteries in Gulen and Berzist, at the church in Rimnica, near the tower of the church in Kalichin those who died on those days are buried. More than 100 people were wounded, Many seriously wounded died in the hospital in Kromorais, including Marcinko, a hero of the battles for Palam. The tragedy in Rimnica occurred on the morning of 6 May due to failure to follow the rules of guarding. Two trucks of the communication platoon of the 2nd Artillery Regiment were ambushed on the road. The first vehicle was set on fire by the Nazis with a Faust patron shot. Hitlerites shot at point-blank range from machine guns and pelted with hand grenades the communicators jumping out of the car. Nineteen soldiers of the courts were left lying in a roadside ditch. Only two managed to save themselves. One of them, with a shot liver, survived the war. Another wounded after retreat of Germans was found unconscious by locals on a bread field where he crawled. One fighter was dragged away by Hitlerites and then left tortured near Svitavik. On the 8th of May came the long-awaited news about capitulation of Germans. The court commander at that time was at the observation post near Vertroslavis, and I was at my CP in Strzybernica, two kilometers southwest of Koten. General Klopolek told me in detail what was happening at the front in the last minutes of the war. There was a complete calm, he said. Occasionally, here and there, shells were still bursting. The infantry was marching through the meadows. I watched the 4th Brigade advancing on the village of Skalka. The forward units of the brigade gradually climbed a wooded hill near the village. Machine gun fire was heard, German mines, and shells were bursting. My observation was suddenly interrupted by the telephone. The chief of staff was calling. I was ordered to return to headquarters immediately. There came an important cipher. This encryption reported that on 7 May 1945, the Germans signed in Reims' act of surrender of all Nazi armed forces. The unconditional surrender took effect on 8 May at 24.00 Central European Time. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. On the night of 8 May 1945, the moon was in its last quarter. The night was dark and starless. 
In spite of all precautions, people were bumping into objects in the darkness, as one could not see a sign. I stationed myself in one of the houses near the motorway. It was late, and I was preparing to wash myself properly. Vila applied water and disappeared. There was no one in the house. Suddenly, quite unexpectedly, a terrible shooting from small arms opened in the street. Explosions rang out, shaking the house. Then it was as if a hurricane had struck. The street was filled with noise and shouts. Horses roared. Riders slammed their whips. All this was traveling in the darkness towards the east. The skirmish was drawing nearer, already firing in the streets. Meanwhile, I was standing in Adam's costume in a tub and dousing myself with water. The Germans have attacked, flashed through my mind at first. Having put out the light, I began to dress hastily, frantically pulling my shirt, but it did not want to fit over my wet body. The gunfire was intensifying. I threw thunder and lightning at Bella for disappearing and leaving me alone in such a serious situation. Finally, he came rushing in and stood with his automatic at the door while I got dressed. I peered through the crack into the street. Along the front line in the night sky, there was a bright glow of thousands of multicolored rockets. They flashed, flared for a moment at the highest point of their flight with dazzling light, and then disappeared, swallowed up by the darkness. From everywhere came the crackle of the rockets being fired, but all this noise was overridden by the thunderous roar of the guns. It was clear to me that peace had come. That's how I met the last minutes of the worst war mankind has ever experienced. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. Tomorrow, the shortest possible route to Prague was the Corps of Commander's laconic order. In the morning, the Germans disappeared. In spite of the terms of surrender, which said that parts of the defeated German army would lay down their arms where they found themselves, the Nazis did not fulfill this condition, fearing retaliation. They fled from the Soviet army, afraid of us. However, they could not escape from the Soviet Air Force, and we had to clear the way among broken vehicles, tanks, guns, or strong carriages. From all this grave rubbish of former German glory, which now clogged all the paths suitable for traveling, along which the Wehrmacht units tried to escape, we hurried with seven-mile steps to the fighting Prague, overcoming fifty to sixty kilometers a day. On the way we passed thousands of columns of German prisoners of war. I did not want to look at these last soldiers of the invincible army. Tired, exhausted, looking not at all like heroes, although they still had the old training and perseverance, but their looks now reflected the utmost hopelessness. So we moved towards Prague through Boscovis, Hopors, Kostelek above Chernilesi. In the neighborhood of Isocene, we merged with the marching columns of the Soviet troops, and our monolithic mass moved forward with difficulty. I remember Polichka, where for the first time after so many years I had enough of cheesecakes. In all towns and villages where we passed, we were warmly welcomed. Everywhere, we were warmed by the warm heart of the motherland. Then we stood in front of the capital for two days in the neighborhood of Miholupa, Dubex to prepare for the solemn march on Prague. There was an atmosphere of peace, of joyful excitement all around. The difficult time was behind us. In towns and villages, everyone was overflowing with joy. The war with all its horrors was over. Both old and young, battle-hardened veterans and young soldiers with no hairlessness were rejoicing. The wind carried the long melodies of the vast Russian plains, and their soft melody blended with sex songs and the nature around bloomed in exuberant color. The honeyed odors of spring filled people's hearts with a sweet sense of peace and happiness. 